The government of the Bahamas does not have the luxury to remain silent as the world watches the unfolding of the FTX saga here in the Bahamas. This according to leader of the Free National Movement, Michael Pintard. I'm Megan Shepherd, and I will have the details on this story tonight on Our News. Reinstate me or face legal action. Why the Free National Movement's vice chair is sending that message to party officials. Plus, our Jamila Mizek shows us how one restaurant is managing the wave of inflation in tonight's business beat. And then in our news at 7.30, Thelma Gibson Primary School in the headlines again as a primary school teacher is set to go on trial for allegedly slapping a woman. Our news live at 7 starts now. Welcome to our news live at 7. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Kendino Knowles. The government coming under fire from the opposition for its role in the FTX drama. Senior members of the Free National Movement heading to the office of the Prime Minister today demanding the Davis administration give an account for its role in and since the collapse of the cryptocurrency trader. A large police presence and barricades filling the parking lot of the Prime Minister's office. Party leader Michael Pintard along with supporters gathering to raise a number of questions unfolding around the FTX saga. There are many questions that we wish to ask. And where does this now put the carbon trading regime that they had in mind? And so we are very much concerned that the government has not uh, been transparent about the due diligence they have conducted in this regard. All politicians, for the election, after the election, should declare did they receive any loans mm -hmm, mm -hmm, from FTX, mm -hmm. campaign contributions, yeah. or gifts? All. All members of parliament ought to declare if they have a digital wallet with cryptocurrency, did they purchase it from FTX or was it gifted? Now for more on what Pintard had to say about the collapse of FTX and the, the Davis administration, tune into our news at 7.30 with Italia Holm. Well, a leaked document is demanding FNM Vice Chairman Richard Johnson be reinstated. In a recent public spat, he was barred from attending opposition party council meetings and stripped of his responsibilities. Mc Berthony McDermott has the latest. A letter addressed to Free National Movement leader Michael Pintard and party chairman Dr. Dwayne Sands is urging them to reinstate Vice Chairman Richard Johnson. The letter reveals that on October 30th, 2022, a memorandum addressed to Johnson from the party chairman reads, effective immediately all duties previously assigned to you as vice chairman have been reassigned. Additionally, Johnson no longer has responsibility for any constituency association and is not authorized to speak on behalf of the party. Two weeks back, the party called an emergency council meeting after a voice note circulated on WhatsApp of Johnson calling a press conference where he intended to call for Dr. Sands' resignation. The council voted 103 to 13, restricting Johnson from attending future council meetings. Afterwards, Johnson had this to say to reporters. In the party, it is saying that, that other people can get away with certain things and other people are chastised for certain things. Johnson retained the legal counsel of former PLP Marcos City MP Gregory Moss. That's the seat Pintard now holds. The letter also reads the reassignment by Dr. Sands and the prohibition against him speaking on behalf of the party was done without any meeting of the executive committee having been called to consider and authorize the same. It continues, no vote of the executive committee was taken to suspend our client's membership therein nor reassign his duties as vice chairman. Following that emergency council meeting, the party's chairman said this. It is totally a distraction. And yet uh, we believe that the matter has to be uh, had to be brought to a head and dealt with. Johnson has expressed his unwavering support for former leader Dr. Hubert Minnis and is rumored to be on his payroll. The letter gives the party until November 23rd to respond or the matter will go to the Supreme Court. Both Pintard and Sands declined to comment on this matter. Reporting for Our News, I'm Berthony McDermott. We want more. That's the position of the president of the Bahamas Public Services Union, Kim Ferguson. He's demanding public sector workers get paid more, even though government recently raised minimum wage and the financial secretary warning of what a recession could do to the economy. Ferguson wants government to reconsider the offer to public servants. We're asking the government to give those persons in the M scale a minimum of a hundred dollars increase. 
Uh, the union leader had much more to say on the issue. We've got more on that in our news at 730. Well, global inflation and a rising cost of living making it difficult for many to just survive. But tonight, our Jamila Mizik tells us how one local business is finding ways to make products more affordable and pass those savings along to their customers. Local businesses feeling the pinch as global inflation trickles down, but co-owner of the Bush Cook, Corey Small, says they have been adjusting as best they could to suit the needs of their business. We just look at our structure of business and our strategy, and we look at how we can operate differently, how we can extend hours, how we can cut back hours, how we can make staffing more effective and efficient. Um, looking at costing, looking at the availability of items, and that's one of our main concerns, that the availability of items are not there. Um, costing has gone up in a lot of items, but it also has gone down in other items as well. So it, it's almost a balance. And while he says most items have to be imported, they've learned to determine where there should be cutbacks. Most of our stuff are traditionally going to come from the states. But what we, know, we, we tend to do, we support our local industries in terms of our farmers. But as a business owner, we have to make a decision. I'm going to purchase a case of heavy cream or I can maximize getting more chicken wings. So just looking at your menu, looking at what's going out, what's coming in. Small says they've also found ways to cut costs on electricity. We lean more on Mother Nature now, so we reduce the use of the air condition. Um, we maximize our refrigerators and our freezer, whether it's compacting it down to one. Um, even with our televisions, we normally try to have them turn off a certain time. Um, so we normally try to include in our budget bills, utilities, and costs every month to ensure that we touch every bill that is out there. But he says a key success to their business is always finding ways to be creative. We collaborate a lot. We look at social media. We look at trends. And that's why I tell any business owner, be creative. Um, think outside the box. Continue to push. Continue to look for new things. Um, anything. Just keep on pushing. Reporting for our news, I'm Jamila Misek. Thanks, Jamila, and we've got a whole lot more to get to. But for now, it's time for your first look at temperatures across the country. Meteorologist Greg Thompson, he's standing by in the Weather Center. Greg? Yeah, thanks, Kendina, and a good Friday evening, everybody. A very cloudy day around our islands today, and it's cloudy outside right now. Temperatures dipping into the 70s, 76 degrees right now on the mostly cloudy skies. We do have a few light sprinkles out there. It winds out of the northeast at 15 miles per hour, so it's a little on the breezy side, and your temperature feels like temperature hanging out at 82 degrees. Around the islands tonight, temperature-wise, 71 in Freeport, 76 in Marshall, and that 71 in Freeport is very cool right now, actually. 79 in Alistown, Bimini, as well as in Great Harbor Key. We pick up 78 in Nicholstown, Andros. Over in Governor's Harbor, we are 81 there, 76 here in the capital. Central Bahamas, mid to low 80s, 82 is in Kemp's Bay, Arthur's Town. Then we pick up 84 in Georgetown, 78 in Cuban Downs in Salvador, 80 in Deadman's Key, Long Island, Southeast Bahamas. Temperatures mm, comfortable down there as well. 81 in Duncan Town, Rygate Island, 80 in Colonel Hill, Crooked Island. We pick up 85 in Abrams Bay, Delectable Bay, Acklands, 77, 82 in Matthew Town, Inago, and our neighbors to the southeast, Turks and Caicos Islands. You round out our temperature profile at 84. Satellite-wise, around the area, we do have that stall frontal boundary. It actually drifted just south of the capital. It's now across most of the northern Exuma chain, and uh, there's extensive clouds behind it, and those cloudy conditions will remain with us. We do have a lot of moisture coming out of the uh, Gulf of Mexico and the Western Caribbean that will continue to ride along this front. And we do expect a low-pressure system to develop sometime on Sunday. That should bring us more clouds and some showers by the early part of next week. That's our quick check on weather. Stick with us and look at the tropics and your extended forecast is still to come. Ahead on our news at 7, Grand Bahama business owners say the island needs a new airport. Also on Grand Bahama, a 22-year-old man is helping police in their investigation into a Thursday night stabbing. Plus, a $250,000 cocaine fine on Abaco. How police made the bust is coming up on the other side of the break. A call for the Minister of Works to resign from the leader of the Free National Movement today, our Megan Shepherd, tells us why.
Free National Movement's leader Michael Pintard continuing to insist that the governing progressive Liberal Party could have saved the country millions of dollars and avoided a price hike for customers with Bahamas Power and Light. What is egregious is that they fail to tell the public that they got recommendations on how to avoid a 163% increase in fuel charge. So if you're a vulnerable Bahamian, it could go up by 35%. If you're middle class uh, or, or if you're a business, it could go up close to 100%. Pintard says not only did Minister of Works Alfred Sears make a bad judgment call, he compounded the issue. When we laid a document in, in the House of Assembly, they started to backpedal, but pride would not allow them, would not allow them to be completely transparent that they knew there were recommendations. We believe that the statements made by Alfred Sayers in the last sitting of the House was absolutely crystal clear. He then completely admitted that he knew, which meant he knew he was telling an untruth consistently. And he went further to say the Prime Minister knew. And the minute they said the Minister of Finance was aware. So he threw the Prime Minister un, un, under the bus. Pintard is calling for Prime Minister Philip Davis to be transparent with those documents and also calling for Sears to resign. I don't believe there's any other recourse for that minister but to resign. It is the appropriate Amen. thing to do. Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. Let's go. The Prime Minister should also now, Let's go. the Prime Minister has to indicate if what his colleague said about him was truthful. He's a senior a member of our parliament, a senior member of the bar. He understands the impact of giving a statement that he know not to be correct. Reporting for Our News, I'm Megan Shepard. Well, the fallout continues from the collapsed sale of the Grand Lucayan Resort and what it means for the future of Grand Bahama International Airport. President of the Grand Bahama Chamber of Commerce, James Carey, and President of Freeport Ship Services, Jeremy Caffarata, want to know what is happening with the redevelopment of the airport. Uh, Deputy Prime Minister said at the time that um, they're not prepared to reveal anything. Well, uh, we, we do need to know something. Um, and while you know, we can accept and respect the degree of confidence or confidentiality, um, we need to know a little something about what's likely to happen with that. It just seems to be a lot of announcements. I think it's um, frustrating for a lot of people. I think that a lot of people are losing patience. Uh, I think a lot of people, like myself, just want to see some action. Well, we've got a full report on the Grand Bahama business community's reaction to the failed sale of Grand Lucayan and the ongoing issues with the airport. It's coming up in our news at 730. Well, a security guard accused of using his phone to record under a subway customer's skirt has been granted $5,000 bail. As a condition of bail, Cron Wallace has to wear an ankle monitor. He returns to court for trial on February 24th. Prosecutors say Wallace indecently assaulted a 19-year-old subway customer while she was at the restaurant's soda fountain on November 15th. And a man is in serious condition tonight after he was stabbed in his back in Grand Bahama on Thursday. The incident happening shortly after 7 p.m. at a business on Pioneer's Way in Freeport. Police say the victim got into an altercation with a man he knew and was stabbed in his back. He was taken to hospital for treatment. A 22-year-old is in custody. And a 46-year-old man from Murphytown, Abaco, is in police custody for cocaine possession. Police found him with 12 kilos of co cocaine after a tip led to a search of his apartment. They also found $7,000 cash. When our news comes back from the break, we turn our spotlight to stories making headlines across the world as a Saudi prince gets immunity over the murder of a journalist in 2018. Plus, we take a look at some of the highlights of Bahamas Air's inaugural flight between Freeport and Raleigh and what it means for the Bahamas. And empowering the young, how the GBPA is stepping up. The details when our news returns.
This is our news. Welcome back. We turn our attention now to stories making headlines across the world. The United States has given immunity to Saudi Arabia's de facto leader, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, for the lawsuit filed by his fiancé, or the fiancé, that is, of murder journalist Jamal Khashoggi. The prominent Saudi critic was killed in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul in October of 2018. U.S. intelligence say it believes Prince Mohammed ordered the killing. U.S. court filings say his immunity was due to his new role as Saudi prime minister. Khashoggi's ex-fiancé tweeted, Jamal died again today with this ruling. Twitter employees told that the company's buildings will be temporarily closed immediately. In a message seen by the BBC, workers were told that offices would reopen on Monday. It gave no reason for the move. The announcement comes amid reports that large numbers of staff were quitting after new owner Elon Musk called on them to sign up for longer hours at high intensity or leave. The message went on to say, please continue to comply with company policy by refraining from discussing confidential company information on social media. Look, this is essentially a game of thrones between Musk and the Twitter employees. And it's a black eye from Musk in terms of, I think, the way that looks publicly, and even on the brand around Tesla. And I think it just shows, I mean, this is really a quicksand situation that he's trying to fix. And the more he does, ultimately the more damage he does, which continues to just be a twilight zone as it plays out. More than 2,000 employees at 112 Starbucks locations held a strike Thursday as the union has been organizing stores for the last year. The strike is in protest of retaliation against union supporters nationwide, as well as the company's refusal to bargain on a first labor deal. There are 264 stores that have voted in favor of union representation, but no contracts have been negotiated, even at stores that voted nearly a year ago. Starbucks claims to be a progressive company, but they drive us to the bone every single day. Um, our health care is unaffordable for many of us. I make maybe $17 an hour, and I live in New York City. A meal is barely $17 these days. Leaders at the United Nations summit in Egypt repeating that it is not fair to expect them to cover the costs of rebuilding from devastating weather events as the climate warms up. A plan put forward by Barbados' Prime Minister Mia Motley would overhaul the way much of development lending works. It also gives a voice to developing nations struggling under rising debt. That this is the and a man from Quebec has been charged with terrorism for an alleged plot to topple the Haitian government. 51-year-old Gerald Nicholas was charged by the Canadian Federal Police Force Thursday. Haitian President Jean-Venel Moïse was killed in July 2021 by gunmen who stormed his home in Port-au-Prince. Canadian police say the charges against Nicholas was, were not related to the assassination. The investigation that began in July 2021 revealed that Nicholas is planned to stage an armed revolution in Haiti and ultimately seize power. He's facing three charges related to terrorism, including leaving Canada to take part in terrorist activity and producing property for terrorism purposes. Obama's Air touching down in Raleigh, North Carolina, marking the start of a new route for the national airline. Passengers applauding the new route, connecting Raleigh and Freeport, Grand Bahama. It's a deliberate move to try and get more economic activity going on the island. On the return to Grand Bahama, the plane was greeted by a water salute. Inbound passengers also greeted with a short ceremony outside the international terminal. Minister for Grand Bahama, Ginger Moxie, calling the new route wonderful news for the island. Yes, Grand Bahama has gone through a lot, but today it's a new day. There's been a lot of new developments when you were left. Today is rally. Last week we had Charlotte reintroduced. We have Toronto and Montreal starting up in December, and we also had Orlando a few months ago. And despite the challenges there, the minister says things are happening and encourages Grand Bahamians to remain positive. 
developments are happening, the cruise port is happening, and so um, really I want people to prepare themselves, not just for jobs, but for entrepreneurial opportunities because we're doing a lot of work with the touristic product development to create vendor opportunities for our people, and so I'm, I'm truly excited about what's happening for them. Still to come in our news today in history, find out interesting facts about the day that was November 18th. You know its name. The mouse makes his first debut on this day in 1928. Plus, Greg is back with your extended weather forecast. And then in our news at 7.30, the Anglican Church says farewell to the late canon Warren Roll in a beautiful send-off. It's all coming up when our news returns. Welcome back to our news. It's time now to turn our spotlight on events that shaped the day that was November 18th. Take a look. On this day in 1928, Walt Disney's Mickey Mouse made his first appearance at the Colony Theater in New York in a film called Steamboat Willie. Then in 1978, American pastor Jim Jones led 914 of his followers to their deaths at Jonestown, Guyana by taking cyanide-laced drinks. Cult members who refused were shot. Jones was a charismatic churchman who established the People's Temple, a Christian sect in Indianapolis in the 1950s. He preached against racism and his integrated congregation attracted many African Americans. And finally, in 1993, black and white leaders in South Africa approved a new democratic constitution which gave blacks the vote. It was an historic milestone on their negotiated journey beyond apartheid. Democracy negotiators also agreed that the coalition government scheduled to be elected April 27th in the country's first all-races election will rule in the spirit of national unity. Well, the Grand Bahama Port Authority's seed program designed for STEM empowerment and educational development for young Bahamian students hosting its second coding workshop this week. Earlier this year, two private Grand Bahamian schools experienced their own workshops. GBPA Business Development Officer and Seed Program Project Manager Trevor Simmons. This time we had to show love to the government schools to make sure that they have the opportunity as well. So ultimately we're going to target all of the schools within that seven through nine demographic. Um, when it comes down to actually choosing the students um, as directed by our facilitator STEM board, um, we want to make sure that it's not based on the brightest, you know, or the smartest. It's those who are actually generally interested in the, the workshops themselves. Because we want to give everybody the opportunity and you don't want to use one measuring stick to measure everyone. Um, so we want to give as many students as possible the opportunity to experience not just this workshop but our future programs as well now to watch more stories like that and for all of today's top stories visit ournews.bs that does it for us in news at seven joining us now is our talia hall talia it's good to have you back tonight yes ken it's an honor to be back after a long day yesterday i know yes <laughs> went to rally north carolina an amazing experience with lots of flights and it's always good news when you hear about Grand Bahama increasing their airlift. Right, how, how was it though? I, I think it's it's the city of Jerome's alma mater, right? Yes, it is, yeah. it is, it yeah. is, it is. It was very interesting, a lots of history and we have more stories coming from Raleigh, North Carolina next right. week. Okay, so Ken, lots more to get to in the bottom of the hour as the FTX drama continues to unfold and the call for salary increases by public servants. First in our news live at 7.30, what's the relationship between the Progressive Liberal Party and FTX? That's the question the opposition is putting to the Prime Minister. Plus, the BPSU pushes for salary increases as members face rising costs of food, gas and electricity. And later, how Grand Bahamians are holding on to hope. 
reflecting on the failed sale of the Grand Lucayne Resort. And the Anglican Church says farewell to the man described as living a life that spoke for itself, the late Canon Warren Rowe. Our news live at 7.30 starts in a moment. Welcome to our news and thank you for joining us. I'm Natalia Hall. Senior members of the Free National Movement demanding the Davis administration to be accountable for its role in the FTX drama following the collapse of the company. Our Megan Shepard gets us started. There are many questions that we wish to ask. A large police presence and barricades filling the parking lot of the office of the Prime Minister this morning as leader of the opposition Free National Movement Michael Pintard, along with supporters, gathered to raise a number of questions surrounding the unfolding FTX saga. At what point did they come in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas? Who did they meet with, if anyone, in the previous administration? We should, the public should be able to see what was in the minutes of those meetings. Pintard also noting that the government indicated that they fully expected to be trading carbon credits on the FTX platform by December. The FNM leader says there are questions that need answers. All politicians, for the election, after election, should declare. Did they receive any loans mm -hmm, mm -hmm. from FTX, mm -hmm. campaign contributions? Mm -hmm or gifts, all members of parliament ought to declare if they have a digital wallet with cryptocurrency, did they purchase it from FTX or was it gifted? He also addressed implications that the previous f and administration was aware of FTX's interest in the Bahamas. To that, Pintard says he had no direct contact. He also insisted anyone that was aware should provide the relevant information. And as the world continues to watch, Pintard says the prime minister must operate in transparency as silence allows for the world to create their own narrative. Some of the smartest people in the world uh, seem to have been involved with this company. So before they cast aspersions on the Commonwealth of the Bahamas without hearing the full results of the in investigation, mm -hmm. uh, we tell them the to look in the mirror. That report from our Megan Shepard. Thanks so much, Megan. Well, the Bahamas Public Services Union pushing for salary increases for its members. Already at minimum wage, Bertha McDermott picks up the story from here. If you have a recession, it the impact has always felt at the low income levels. It was this admission from the financial secretary that's prompting the Bahamas Public Services Union to push for an increase to public servants already at minimum wage. Union President Kimsley Ferguson says they're trying to get government to reconsider its offer for public servants in this category. We're asking the government to give those persons in the M scale a minimum of a hundred dollars increase. Ferguson says the suggestion was made to Financial Secretary Simon Wilson. He says the response was that this would create irregularities, but he's offering it be done in the form of increments. If granted and is fashioned in the form of an increment, there would be no anomalies created. So we're just asking that whatever increases are given are competitive in the food stores and in the service stations, as, as, as we know that the persons at the lower end of the scale will be drastically impacted. This plea from the BPSU president comes as Bahamians continue to see rising costs of food, gas, and more recently an increase in power bills. During Thursday's press briefing at the office of the Prime Minister, Wilson foreshadowed a potential recession could disrupt positive financial trends. Wilson added that low-income families would be the most impacted. Ferguson says the suggestion was included in the counter-proposal recently sent to the Ministry of Public Service as negotiations continue for a new industrial agreement. We are making that appeal to the government of the Bahamas and to the Prime Minister for an audience so that we can bring closure to this. Reporting for Our News, I'm Bertha McDermott. 
All business owners on Grand Bahama weighing in on that failed sale of the Grand Lucayne Resort. They say it's unfortunate that the island is back at square one. President of Wa Construction Godfrey Wa says he was disappointed when he first heard the news, given that so many people were looking forward to it. You know, when you walk around Port Lucaya now, it's empty. Um, when you remember back a few years, it was bustling with activity. So um, I think we're all looking forward for something to happen to the hotel. President of the Chamber of Commerce, James Carey, says he wasn't too surprised that the deal collapsed following the announcement of several extensions. So I think this is the third government now that has been trying to sell the hotel. Um, and uh, there's failure yet again. Um, we were hopeful uh, at the beginning of the year, particularly, that the hotel would have been sold this time. Um, it does impact the uh, Grand Bahama community as a whole. But Wa says he's anxiously waiting to hear what will happen to the Grand Bahama International Airport. If you traveled at all, you know it's not an ideal situation. So, um, you know, ideally we'd like to get something going at the airport. Kerry and the president of Freeport Ship Services, Jeremy Cafferata, say Grand Bahamians need to know more about the redevelopment of the airport. We do need to know something. Um, and while, you know, we can accept and respect the degree of confidence or confidentiality, um, we need to know a little something about what's likely to happen with that. It just seems to be a lot of announcements. I think it's um, frustrating for a lot of people. I think that a lot of people are losing patience. Uh, I think a lot of people, like myself, just want to see some action. But Kerry says he believes that the magic can return to Freeport. No interest in the politics of the matter. We are simply interested in business and, uh, and the, the whole of the community doing well. Um, and we know that can happen when businesses flourish. A cool evening in the capital tonight, a nice change from the norm. Meteorologist Greg Thompson is in the Weather Center with the latest. Good evening, Greg. Thanks, Italian. and welcome everybody for our first check on weather on the second half of our newscast. Temperatures very comfortable outside right now in the mid 70s, 76, and that's rain cool. We do have some isolated showers out there. We have mostly cloudy skies. Your winds are out of the northeast at 15 miles per hour. Those winds are breezy and will continue to be breezy tonight. Your feels like temperature now at 82 degrees. Satellite view, we have that frontal boundary that moves through the uh, northwest Bahamas now across the central Bahamas, mainly stationary, falling stationary across the uh, northern exuberant chain extensive clouds behind that will continue to keep us rather cloudy for the rest of the evening and into tonight and we expect these clouds to hang around as that moisture plume coming out of the Gulf of Mexico and the uh, southwestern Caribbean will ride along that front more showers in, in your forecast tonight through tomorrow that's your first check on weather stick with us look at the tropics is still to come still to come on our news a primary school teacher to stand trial for allegedly slapping a woman at a PTA meeting, that story is straight ahead. And Village Road residents and people who work in the area weigh in on the state of roadworks, as it's said to be a busy weekend along Village Road. And how Grand Bahamian students are cracking the code to STEM careers. That's all coming up when our news returns. A teacher at Thelma Gibson Primary will go to trial in February for allegedly slapping a woman at a PTA meeting. 43-year-old Lakeisha Gray Davis denied an assault charge as she stood before Assistant Chief Magistrate Silvaswola Swain. Prosecutors say she assaulted Tamisha Daxon at Thelma Gibson Primary on October 7th. Gray Davis is freed on a $2,000 bail. Her alleged victim is the daughter of Olivia Daxon, the school's embattled principal. Now, teachers walked off their jobs in protest back in September, calling for Daxon's dismissal after she allegedly assaulted Shanique Sweeting, a teacher. Principal Daxon has been charged with assault over the September incident and will face trial on December 19th. 
A man and woman Atlanta natives arrested on Wednesday after they were found with suspected marijuana. Police reports say the 32-year-old man and 23-year-old woman were arrested at Linden Pinland International Airport just before 4 p.m. Now police did not give a quantity of drugs found. They are growing pains of the worst kind. Commuters on Village Road continue to face daily diversions as the $9.4 million infrastructural upgrades and roadworks drive on well past the deadline. Tonight, our Jamila Mizik has reactions from the area. Road work on Village Road showing no signs of meeting its end of November deadline set by the Ministry of Works. This roadside vendor says the road improvements has been affecting her business. It slowed, slowed down the sales. A lot of people, they don't want to stop or pull on the side like. because they say it's hard for them to even get back in line on, on to go where they're going on the road. But not everyone is opposed to the road improvements. All businesses on Village Road probably had a slight dip, but isn't it better to know that in a year from now, you may have a bigger increase because people can get to your building much quicker and in less traffic. Vice Principal at Queen's College, Joycelyn Taylor says the school has had to make some adjustments by introducing staggered dismissal times, as well as the Ministry of Works has provided an additional two entrances to the campus for easier access. Of course, they've had to make the adjustments, try to come out a little bit earlier. The traffic is a little bit tighter, but we've been blessed too because we've seen not as much probably lateness as we would have anticipated because of the alternate um, opportunities they have to enter the campus. So we've, we've worked, done what we can to make it work. They say they're looking forward to the future benefits of a new and improved road. What's going to come out of this? I think that's what we keep our focus on and then we, we're better able to handle what we're going through right now. Improving always has growing pains and it is better to do something the right way than to rush something. I wouldn't mind if it took two years to say this road has been done properly and we're not going to come and dig it again because digging it frustrates people. Reporting for our news, I'm Jamila Mizik. When our news comes back from the break, the Anglican Church celebrates the life of the late Canon Warren Road. Coming up in sports tonight, the Caribbean Baseball Cup will be held in the Bahamas next month and the UB men's basketball team on the move again. That's all coming up in sports. But first, junior high students are coding their way to the future. How young the humans are taking up the challenge. All of the details when our news returns. This is our news. Welcome back. This week, we shared how the SEED program in Grand Bahama is teaching students to code. Tonight, we hear from the students themselves. Here's our Marlena Leonard. You have the buzzer, the resistor, LED, which is light emitting diode, and today students are going to build this from scratch. Grand Bahamian students in the second cohort of the GBPA's SEED coding workshop will be tasked to construct and code a car's backup sensor using Lingo coding kits. And they are ready for the challenge. This morning, students from Sister Mary Patricia Russell Junior High School spilled their excitement and their nerves for the day ahead. I don't have much experience with coding. Like, I'm a little new to the technology world. <laughs> but I'm excited to see the um, possibilities that I get to learn new things. I actually wanted to be uh, an engineer for computers. I wanted to build hardware for computers. This student shared the creative project he hopes to achieve using the coding skills he'll be learning. I'm very interested in science and technology. Those are the two main things I'm happy about. Technology, I like the game. Designing my own game was something I wanted to do for a while, so that would help out. 
And the learning experience doesn't stop at the end of the day. Lingo's co-founder and chief operating officer, Dr. Jarvis Salser, explains that the kit includes over 18 components and learning materials for future projects so kids can continue self-paced learning at home. One of the questions was, can we bring this home? And uh, the, the answer was yes. And so they're really excited that they can continue to learn beyond just this one day. You'd never guess it, but Salser wasn't always a star student. In fact, he went from having a 1.8 GPA to now having a Master of Science degree and a PhD in nuclear science and engineering from Cornell University. Today, he's sharing that journey with students, hoping to prove the point that even if you aren't starting as the strongest student, you too can go great lengths in learning. Reporting for Our News. I'm Marlena Leonard. All right, great initiative. Thanks, Marlena. And Alive, a key sponsor in this week's GBPA seed coding workshops, helping government school children to learn how to code. Alive head of marketing and brand Nicolette Eldon says there's more to come. It, it gives us gratification to be a part of that process, a part of the movement um, to find our rightful place in the workplace in these fields that are often male dominated. It's, it's gratifying. We chose to sponsor this program and yes, we, are, we do have future plans because this is a part of our corporate social responsibility, um, technology, innovation, the whole STEAM is a part of our social responsibility. Sports in paradise. It's the backdrop to major baseball tournament here next month, a major baseball tournament rather, and the UB Mingo's men's basketball team is on the move again. Sasha Lightborn is up now with a check on sports. All right, thanks, Italia, and welcome to our sports, everyone. I'm Sasha Lightborn in for Marcellus Hall. The Bahamas will be the backdrop for the 2022 Caribbean Baseball Cup next month. This will be the fourth time for the event, but the first time it will be held in the Bahamas and at the new Andre Rogers Baseball Stadium. Secretary General of the Bahamas Baseball Association, Theodore Sweeting. This is an exciting time for baseball. Uh, exciting time for our country that we'll be hosting a qualifier for the CAC Games in 2003, which is going to be hosted in El Salvador. So two teams out of this competition will then become eligible to go to the CAC Games. And I think that's historic for us, for, the, for our country and the standpoint of our history in baseball. Six teams will compete along with the Bahamas. Haiti, the U.S. Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, Cuba, and Curacao. And according to Sweeting, the Bahamas' team is more than ready. Oh, the team is in Grand Bahama. We, we are, it's basically because that's the only place we have a full 90-foot diamond field for them to practice and get ready for. And a lot of our other players are still in college. They'll be home by the 28th, and then we'll get ready to put that team on the field. In other news, the University of the Bahamas' men's basketball team are coming off a big win at homecoming last week and are hoping to carry that momentum this weekend in South Florida as they take on Atlantis University in a two-game tour. Head coach Bacchus Rule says the team will be making adjustments but is looking for a win. The American game is slightly different. And and it's just a model, a model of us being very patient, uh, being very confident in what we do and playing our game. Finally, the second edition of Bahama Hoops begins tomorrow. The tournament will feature 20 men's and women's basketball teams from 16 states throughout the United States in action at the Mega Resort. Now our very own coach Yolette McEwen and the Ole Miss women's basketball team will be in town as well. Fans can go to BahamaHoops.com for more information on how to purchase tickets. And that's your look at sports here on this Friday. I'm Sasha Lightborn. Back to you, Italia. Still ahead on our news tonight, a beautiful send-off for the late Cannon Warren roll. Plus, what kind of weather can you expect this weekend? Our Greg Thompson is back in the Weather Center right after this break.
Welcome back to our news. You may want to bring your umbrella as possible showers may be this weekend. Greg is back in the weather center with your weekend weather planner. Good evening again, Greg. Thanks again, Natalia, and welcome back, everybody. We are still tracking a frontal boundary that's pushed into the northwest Bahamas overnight. It's now across the uh, central Bahamas, basically parked along the uh, northern Exuma chain. Some moisture associated with that continuing to keep us rather cloudy, and we're still seeing some showers and some isolated thunderstorms along that frontal boundary. This cloud mass will stay with us for at least the end of the weekend into, into early next week as we expect a low-pressure system to develop in the uh, eastern Gulf of Mexico. That will, in turn, ride along that front and drag another boundary across us so we're looking at more showers and thunderstorms in the forecast beginning on Sunday into Monday and possibly even into Tuesday. Behind that nice cold and chilly air mass will not really make it to us. We'll just uh, get to uh, just about the central portions of Florida but it will change our weather pattern over the next couple of days as we expect the uh, high pressure system behind it to strengthen and it's going to continue to provide us with some breezy conditions into early next week so boating may become a challenge at that time. The tropics, we are winding down the Atlantic hurricane season. Nothing happening out there. We have a big upper level, level low system that's spinning out in the open Atlantic. That's keeping uh, some moisture uh, basically in the central Atlantic. No organization there. The Gulf of Mexico as well as the Western Caribbean not showing any signs of development at this time. Taking a look at our future forecast over the next 24 hours, that moisture plume will remain with us and stay across us. We will wind down some of that by Saturday, but by Sunday, as I mentioned, we have a low pressure system that's going to develop in the Gulf of Mexico and that will drag a lot more moisture across us. We're looking at more showers and thunderstorms in the forecast during that time frame. Boating forecast for the northwest and central Bahamas tonight to tomorrow. Small craft use some caution. The winds are going to be out of the northeast to east at 50 knots. They will be gusting higher times. Seas running 3 to 5 feet and of course those seas will be high in gusts. Your low tide will be at 931 tonight. For the southeast Bahamas, caution flag through down there as well. Easterly wind flow at 15 to 20 knots and your seas running 4 to 6 feet over open waters. Here's a look now at your national forecast. In your extended forecast, moisture continuing, showers off and on through Saturday. Sunday, we get a little bit of a break. Temperatures will be back up into the uh, mid 80s. And then Mondays, we get some more showers at that low pressure system pushes across our area. And then we expect some isolated showers throughout the remainder of next week. That's a look at our weather tonight. Make sure you have a safe night and enjoy your weekend. Thanks so much, Greg. Well, well-known and widely loved Anglican priest Canon Warren Harold Road last laid to rest today. Members of the Anglican faith, family and friends paying respects and saying farewells at Christ Church Cathedral in a service celebrating his life and legacy. Retired Justice Ruby Nottage calling it an honor to pay tribute to her former rector, reflecting on Canon Rule becoming rector of St. Mary's Anglican Church. He was a teacher, a teacher extraordinaire, a servant of God, a gentleman, and a scholar. But more than that, as my rector, he was given the care or cure of my soul. Canon Roll was ordained as an Anglican priest back in 1969. He served as an assistant at St. Agnes Anglican Church from 1968 to 1997, serving as rector at St. Mary's from 1997 to 2008. He was returned to St. Agnes, where he was still serving until his retirement and passing. He also taught at St. John's College and up until his death worked at the University of the Bahamas. He was 81, delivering condolences Anglican Bishop Reverend Leish Boyd, describing Canon Roll's life as speaking for itself. I am grateful to him because during those years at St. Agnes Church, he was the assistant priest when many of us were growing up. And he was someone whom we admired, even though we would often laugh at him, imitate him, but we admired him and we knew that he was on our side. Our sympathies and well wishes for the family of the late Canon Roll may his soul rest in peace. And for all of today's top stories, be sure to visit ournews.ps. Thank you for joining us for our news tonight. On behalf of the entire team, I'm Natalia Hall. We'll see you tomorrow night. Have a great evening.